Welcome, everyone. Um, as Ryan just said, I'm, I'm Tom Balderston. I'm honored to be here with you and all of you. Um, I'm just going to speak for a minute or two, and then she's the show. Um, it occurred to me when I was driving up yesterday morning that uh, this is 50 years from my, my initial arrival in Williamstown. And as I look around the room, I think, I don't want to cast aspersions or anything, but I think maybe some of you have been doing that trip longer than I have. Um, little did I know when I was uh, thinking about where to go to college from Berkeley High School in Berkeley, California, that uh, it was going to shape my life in so many ways. And I didn't know, I didn't realize, maybe, maybe you did, but I didn't realize that this was lifelong relationships with people, with the college, and with this beautiful valley. And <clears throat> trust me when I say the people part is an understatement for me. Uh, the purple socks. There's a guy here, right over there, from the Purple Levy family, the Purple Levy Miller family. So I try not to compete uh, with him. Um, many of you have had a similar experience of thinking you came here for four years and this is how your life unfolded from there. Um, so I've been involved as an alum in many ways. Um, and most recently with Susan Galley, as Ryan said, we're co-chairs of our class's uh, gift purpose committee, which is, for those of you who aren't yet in the window, we are working on what to recommend to our classmates as major gift purposes for our 50th reunion class. And so we had a meeting yesterday um, where we covered a number of topics of interest to us. And it's a fascinating way of getting reconnected with events here and issues and programs and so on. And um, it, we had a hybrid meeting. We have a group of 10 of us. And Half of us were here in person, and the other half were, were on Zoom. One classmate's in Italy right now, but she didn't want to miss it. Um, so um, we're excited to be back for the mini reunion with all of you. Um, and now, the conversation with Maud. Um, by way of format, we're going to talk. We have a handful of questions that we've kicked around together. Um, and then we'll open it up for 15 or 20 minutes for questions from you folks. There will be mics traveling around the room. Uh, uh, we are, this is being recorded, um, so take that into consideration. <laughs> um, so uh, without further ado, how about a framing question, Maud? Um, seven years, seven years in. Um, an awful, awful lot of things come your way as president of this college. Um, how about a top one or two accomplishments and another couple of initiatives? Sure. So first, let me just uh, take a moment to welcome everybody. It's really uh, wonderful to have you here on campus and the wonderful uh, tradition that is the uh, 50th reunion journey. Um, it goes on for longer than a year at Williams and is um, uh, always uh, so um, so wonderful for me to be able to interact with so many folks who have long-term uh, relationships with the college. As you note, year seven for me, so I'm, I'm not quite at 50 yet, but, uh, but on the path. And, uh, and it has been a, a, a very uh, dramatic time in higher education, of course, as you know. Um, but nevertheless, um, and I know we'll talk about some of those things, but um, I would say uh, we have really been able to do um, a number of important things over the years, and you ask about uh, accomplishments. So I think one of the things I'm most 
proud of and thrilled that we were able to do was the, uh, intro the introduction um, two years ago of the All Grant Financial Aid Program, which allowed Williams to really become a leader in financial aid. It had been, and uh, but it was really building on a legacy um, by uh, replacing um, uh, work study and loans with uh, a full grant program uh, to meet families' need. And that has been um, a, a game changer at Williams in lots of ways. Maybe we can um, talk a bit about it later, uh, but really quite, quite thrilled uh, with that. Um, I'm also very excited about the um, moving forward of the new Williams College Museum of Art, which um, I know you've heard a little bit about. And uh, we, if you drove past the rotunda, you can see that the process has begun actually We've been talking about it a long time. It's really exciting to actually uh, start the process of having shovels in the ground um, with the goal of opening a new uh, Williams College Museum of Art in 2027. It's a really uh, an important initiative for a college that A, has a very deep um, commitment and legacy uh, around the teaching of uh, arts as part of um, the curriculum. And it's really a stake in the ground, um, I think, in the humanities um, at a time when the importance of an integrative um, uh, college education that uh, embeds humanities in everything else students are doing um, uh, is so important uh, to Williams and to the legacy and to the future. And so this is a really uh, exciting um, uh, sort of two sets of accomplishments um, that I would mention. Uh, we also have a couple of other things underway. Um, as you, I think some of you attended a session on our athletics and well-being work, um, which is really primarily focused on facilities. We've got a new um, multi-purpose recreation center that is going up as an interim field house while we move that project forward. Um, and uh, we're doing a program study for figuring out um, uh, the longer term investment in facilities uh, that will grow out of this, uh, that will include obviously support for our tremendously successful um, varsity athletics teams, but also uh, is really meant to support the entire community. 100% of our students have uh, physical education um, requirement. Every single person uses the facilities. Our faculty and staff uh, use the fitness uh, center. Uh, and so we're really taking a hard look at how to ensure that um, we can be healthy uh, be uh, as we uh, live and study here in the Purple Valley because we have a long tradition, again, 100 years of, uh, I, I like to throw this in when I talk about this, when we open the new museum, we'll be celebrating 100 years of WICMA at Williams. Uh, we likewise are celebrating 100 years of the physical education requirement at Williams. And I think both of these initiatives therefore show you that we are building on strength while ensuring that we uh, have um, long, uh, uh, a long legacy that we can that we can also move into the future in these areas and well-being, of course, is on everybody's minds these days. Um, uh, so um, we're also, I think, and I hope, going to talk a little bit about um, our winter study program, which uh, we have been revamping um, since I got here, and that's been kind of moving step by step forward. Um, and maybe just one other smaller initiative I'd like to mention is um, our Global Scholars Program. Some of you may have heard a little bit about this. Um, this is uh, something, a program that emerged out of our uh, strategic planning process to focus on uh, global education across the disciplines and sectors. Um, so this is a multi-year pilot where we have um, 12 students coming out of the uh, sophomore year class. So they apply for this in late um, spring of their freshman year. And the 12 students enter um, a cohort together. Um, just to give you a sense of how appealing this uh, program is, about one in six of the first year class applied to get into this. So we had something like 75 applications for 12 slots. Um, and this is an immersive program where the students go through um, a course together on uh, global research. They do a winter study abroad. Last year was in Paris. This year it's going to be in Santiago. And they um, they learn about doing research uh, on a wide variety of topics because they come from across the disciplines. Uh, in other countries, there is additional support for language study if that is something they're interested in. And then the goal eventually is for them to work towards a, a senior research project that builds this kind of glo global competency in it. And it's really based on an understanding about education that cohorts 
um, learn well together. You can think about athletic teams, actually, in the way in which an athletic team supports itself that going through uh, an educational process that as a team, but also it actually has dividends for their learning across the college. Likewise, uh, this global cohort program um, builds on that idea of bringing people together across many years. Um, and then, of course, they also sponsored many events. Many of those were open to people across campus, uh, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, um, bringing uh, a, a wide range of topics to the campus for discussion about places around the world. So, so those are just a, a sampling of some of the many things going on uh, right now. Thanks. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, speaking of events going on around the world, we're a year out from October 7th, and um, it's also, uh, and that's had a effect on things for all of us, but especially on campuses around this country. Um, and so maybe you could just comment on um, what's happened here on the Williams campus during the past year regarding events in the Middle East. Sure, thank you. So, uh, so yes, it has been an eventful year, not the only eventful year I've had as college president at Williams. I've had a pandemic, a racial reckoning in the country, uh, and, and then, of course, last year was pretty disruptive at lots of campuses um, across the country. Um, and some of you follow uh, campus more closely than others, so just a little bit of the a year in review to talk about how we approach this. So, very... Um, Shortly after October 7th, I put out a letter explaining that I, I started to call this my unstatement because I put out a letter saying that I wasn't going to be putting out a letter um, and about what happened in the Middle East. And that was really drawn from, uh, it was not a new policy. I actually had decided um, over a year before that that um, I was going to get out of the business of putting out statements. I had, I had put out a lot of statements prior to that, as most college presidents do, about global and national affairs. Um, and I'd really come, and you can read the letter if you want, it's on the webpage, you can link to it, but it really came from a philosophical, um, I don't want to say a discovery, but a, re, a reminder through having put out statements in the past that really it wasn't my job to be telling people what to think about the world. It was uh, to help create an environment where they could figure out what they think about the world themselves and that we're here to teach them uh, how to learn, uh, not what to think. Um, and, uh, and that really um, drove the decision, um, as I say, well before October 7th. But nobody had actually asked about it before that, even though lots of things go on in the world. Uh, but that event uh, struck a nerve and folks were asking me to put out a statement. So instead I put out the, the unstatement. Um, after that, uh, really there were a series of goals over the years um, that we were pursuing to, to sort of address what was happening across the campus that sort of functioned um, within a set of guardrails. The first was that um, we don't actually have a lot of rules at Williams around how um, uh, to limit protest or uh, speaking out, um, which is intentional. Um, we have a few rules, uh, and it's very important for us that students follow the few rules that we have. So we want some guardrails, uh, and we believe that students should stay within that code of conduct, and so therefore we want to um, uh, focus on that, those, making sure that um, people can both express themselves and have the freedom to do so and feel um, that they can do so uh, without retribution, which they can do within the guardrails, while simulta simultaneously ensuring that all students feel connected to the community and uh, like they belong, especially in challenging moments where people are disagreeing, because that can be really hard. Um, uh, on other members of the community um, uh, who, uh, who are uh, being confronted with views that make them uncomfortable. Um, at, William, we at Williams, we had uh, every point of view represented last year. Um, everyone you can think of that you saw expressed in other places was also expressed here one way or another. Um, on the whole, students did uh, what I said. They um, were respectful and principled, focused on the issue, highly disciplined, actually, in their form of activism. Uh, in the few cases where students crossed the line, we made clear um, that that was not okay. And uh, we seek to enforce our rules uh, even-handedly and um, reliably uh, and to, in order to create um, a, an environment where people can have those uh, exchanges. So when I 
trying to underscore here is our, the goal was to educate, um, allow for as the widest range of exchange of ideas possible while ensuring that it happened within the guardrails uh, that uh, we, we put in place. Um, broadly speaking, um, I think we did it pretty well uh, uh, as campuses go. Uh, we had a small encampment. As, as I say, the students uh, were um, highly disciplined in their um, protest. Uh, and so did so within the guardrails, which is to say not disrupting classes, not um, uh, harassing uh, other students. Um, and, uh, and I think um, we should all actually be quite proud of how Williams navigated through that last year. So thank you. Um, I'm personally proud. I, I mentioned at the outset I grew up in Berkeley. Um, <laughs> my Thanks. Sibs and I were campus brats. Our dad was a business school professor, and then he was in the University of California administration during the 60s. Um, so, and actually, my sister found a, an audio tape from the campus radio station where he was representing the University of California system, and one of the other panelists was Eldridge Cleaver. Uh, so, um, I, I, uh, I, I appreciate how smoothly, <laughs> seemingly smoothly by comparison, things have gone here, but, one of the points you've touched on, Maud, is, is how people uh, here in the campus community, students and faculty and staff, can talk to each other, you know, in the, under the sort of broad banner of civil discourse. And um, we, our class, has been interested in this uh, topic, and so we've explored it with you and your senior colleagues, but could you comment on how the college tries to uh, encourage members of the community to talk across different points of view. Sure, thanks. And of course, this is a really big topic right now in higher education, uh, not just at Williams, because at the heart of our endeavor, at what we are trying to do uh, in um, the learning environment is to talk across all kinds of divides, not, not for its own sake, actually, but really to teach people how to draw from evidence um, and knowledge, uh, and a ideally a space of curiosity uh, in order to learn about things they don't know so that they continue to can deepen and engage the conversations they're, they're, they're having. So not argument for argument's sake, but actually to uh, broaden and deepen uh, what we know as human beings and how we can learn from each other. And in fact, I would argue, um, as I talk to a room full of people who have a long, decades-long relationship with the college, that in many ways now, uh, the challenge is even uh, all the greater because our student body is so diverse, um, and and faculty and staff too. But I'll, let me just focus on students for a moment. You know, more global, more socioeconomically diverse, uh, coming uh, from a wider range of places in the United States, racial, ethnic, religious backgrounds uh, than ever before, and so um, the natural. Uh, uh, differences that come from that in, in lifetime experience, backgrounds, um, sort of inherited knowledge, uh, all of those things um, are, are all the more true now than they were um, 50 years ago, although uh, certainly um, no, no community is ever entirely homogenous, but uh, that heterogeneity has just grown and increased over time. Um, here at Williams, where we really emphasize uh, talking across difference, um, most successfully and do the work best is in the classroom. And I can tell you by um, sort of informed anecdote that uh, I heard over and over last year as students were struggling, and many were struggling in October and November and December with very strong feelings about what was happening in the Middle East and how uh, their colleagues were talking about it on campus, their fellow students, and how people in other campuses were talking about it. I, I would often talk to a student who was upset about something on campus, something that happened or something that someone had said or a poster they'd read. Um, and then they would mention that they were in a classroom on the topic. Uh, they were taking a, cl a class on Middle East history or the politics of the Middle East. We had a tutorial last year on the Arab-Israeli conflict. So we had several classes um, uh, just uh, through Jewish studies, lots of things where students were dealing with these issues in the classroom. And each time, and this happened several times, I would be talking to the student about um, their distress about this thing going on in campus. And I would say, sort of, you know, holding my breath, well, how's it going in the classroom? And 
every single time to a person, and I talk to, these are a, students with a breadth of backgrounds and opinions and um, uh, political commitments, and every time they said, oh, it's been going great in my classroom. Um, not that we all agree, and, but that the professor has set it up so that we can actually really dig into the issues um, and, uh, and learn and talk across those differences. And that, for me, was really one of the high points of last year, of really hearing um, the degree to which faculty are doing this. And so that's one way I would say, it, it, probably the single most important way that Williams is really invested and has been. And of course, we have that wonderful seven to one student to faculty ratio. So we have a, t a real ability in tutorials and in the classroom to dig in uh, deeply. Of course, we also did um, programming on the campus uh, on that issue in particular. Um, across the semester, bringing in a lot of folks from uh, a range of points of view. And then, um, sort of more broadly, what I would say is, you know, through um, lots of programming on campus, we have uh, the ability to um, do, uh, engage with students and teach students how to talk across difference through programs out of the Davis Center, through uh, staff, chaplains, um, uh, folks who work in the dean's office, et cetera, who will work with students, particularly after there's been um, a moment uh, of challenge. So a small community, unlike some of the larger uh, universities uh, allows for that, I think, in some ways better. Um, and so there too, I think, um, I think uh, we have a leg up just almost structurally before we, we start uh, working on the problem. But the last thing I'll say just, and it came from something you said uh, about a question that came up at another session this morning about, you know, uh, I, I heard, so I don't know who asked the question, but I heard that someone said, well, when we were in college, we would argue vociferously um, you know, in the dorms, and now we hear that nobody does that anymore, that folks are nervous about sharing their points of view outside the classroom. So I, I don't have an empirical way to answer whether it's different now than in the past. I have some theories about it, which we can talk about whether or not it's actually true. Um, uh, and I think it depends enormously on students uh, and their willingness to do that kind of thing. Um, but here too, I would just point out that our student body is incredibly diverse and they're learning across difference every single day just by engaging with each other um, day in and out, day out as roommates, as entry mates, as teammates, uh, as in the classroom, outside of the classroom. So, you know, whether they're actively debating a particular point of view on a given day, I can't say. Um, I think some do and some don't, but by virtue of personality. But simply by engaging in the Williams of today, uh, that is happening. And, and probably actually much more on colleges' campuses like Williams than anywhere else, because uh, they simply have to. They're, they're here together. Uh, so let, let's stick with academics. Uh, you referenced winter study at the outset, but um, so how about a couple comments on anything you'd like to say about broader academic activities, winter study, and then your own interest in being able to teach when you can? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with the end of that question. So um, I do teach when I can. I've taught uh, regular semester courses a couple of times, and then last year I, I taught winter study. I've, I've really been trying to make a, an effort to um, teach every kind of type of course at Williams over time, um, in part because I talk about the programs all the time and I want to be able to do it from the inside out. So I've taught a tutorial and I've taught an upper level um, research uh, seminar, both of which were in my own discipline of history and Jewish studies. Um, uh, but then last year I taught my first winter study. Um, and it was really important to do it. This was not actually a, a, histor a history course. It was a course, I co-taught a course with a um, fellow member of the senior administration. And that one was on, um, uh, we called it crisis communications, which turned out to be very timely. We had decided to teach that well in advance of October 7th, I should say. Um, but then it turned out to be a very good time. It wasn't only about colleges and universities, but uh, yeah, it turned out to be a uh, good timing. But this year we're gonna do something, I forget exactly what we've called it, but it's more or less like, so you wanna be a college president. I mean, it, it's really about um, sort of learning about how you make change in higher education and thinking about some of actually the very topics we're talking about today. And, and other things. Um, 
but it was important to me to teach winter study because, in fact, we're in a multi-year process to refresh our winter study program. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I had kind of boots on the ground experience with students uh, before I um, went much further down the path of, uh, of thinking about winter study. Um, but in short, what we're doing with this really wonderful Williams tradition of having three and a half weeks in January outside of the regular curriculum to lean into experiential learning um, uh, real, uh, uh, and a, a long alumni engagement, two really big parts of um, where winter study has gone over the years, uh, to extend what's, uh, what's uh, wonderful about it, um, and to lean into where students are now and what they're looking for. Um, and here are some of the things I learned when I got here. Um, first, I learned that most, not all, but most students really love winter study. Second, what they love about it is they like doing something, they like to be here, the ones that do, some leave, and I can come back to that, but if they're on campus, they want to be spending time with their friends, learning things without only studying for tests and, and breaking, uh, you know, the not getting enough sleep, and like they want, they want time to just enjoy themselves with their friends while they're learning. That's the second thing I learned. The third thing I learned is um, that uh, students are hungry for experiential um, opportunities to learn, uh, which they get during the academic year, but um, as summers and winter study really offer a time to do that. And the fourth thing I learned um, is that um, they uh, uh, are, are ever looking for um, interesting uh, mentoring and support and engagement with alumni. And I'll just say the 4.5 thing I learned is that alumni are even hungrier for that than students are, actually. Um, and so with all of those pieces of information in mind, coupled with the fact that for decades at Williams, faculty have been saying, we also love winter study. It's a great time to do mentoring of students, independent study, research training, a senior thesis education, um, but what we don't really love doing is teaching things that are outside of our doctoral training. So you have faculty teaching what we used to call regular um, winter study courses. You know, you have a chemist teaching um, uh, baking, uh, for example, or, uh, and the faculty are we're always sort of looking for something that students would want to do that fit all those other things I just said, but weren't actually what they were trained to do. So in the refresh, uh, what we're trying to do is focus faculty on the part of winter study that they do well, those things that I already mentioned, and expand the parts of it that students are hungry for. Um, and we're doing that in a couple of ways. First, we are, um, we, we are, uh, we're in the process of, we haven't decided yet, but we're in the process of thinking about that three and a half arc. A winter study class at Williams has traditionally been one three and a half week block. And we've been thinking, you know, could we do shorter courses that, um, but potentially several of them, for example, and again, these are just ideas right now, where we could bring more alumni to campus to engage with students. Because one of the challenges in winter study has been that if you were an alum who wanted to teach in the program, you had to be in Williamstown in January with a place to live for three and a half weeks. And you can imagine who has free time in January and has a home in Williamstown uh, and nothing better to do for three and a half weeks. And that's been wonderful, but it really limits who can come, right? It means people with young kids can't come, people who don't have uh, economic resources to you know, figure out a place to live for three and a half weeks, et cetera. So if we can sort of play with the structure a little bit, we can actually open it up for more alumni to participate. So that's uh, one thing we've been looking at. We've also been looking at students want more what, we, what they call winternships, experiential learning opportunities uh, for leaving campus and trying other things. So we're just, looking at lots of different ways to, to use this. We've also been thinking about, uh, we get hunger for sort of life skill classes here at Williams and no really great time to teach them, like financial literacy, for example. Um, and winter study provides a great opportunity, particularly for first year students and uh, well-being initiatives, sort of um, how to do hard things well, uh, which is really coming out of some of our, our well-being work on campus, et cetera. So, um, so, you know, stay tuned. This is really in motion at the moment. But, um, but I'm hoping over the next two or three Januaries to, to launch a refreshed program. Um, we have a couple more, and then we'll turn to you all. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the museum at the outset, the art, new art museum, Maud. But and so just, just one follow-up on that. Um, why now? OK, great question. So um, 
uh, as a historian, I can never answer the why now without going back just a little. So I would say just a reminder of what I said before about um, the tradition of the arts at Williams um, is deep and profound, not just that hundred years of WICMA, but um, I hope most of you know the impact of our small liberal arts college on the arts in the United States, but the combination of our, un our strong undergraduate program um, and our uh, small but mighty graduate program means that Williams has people in most of the major art museums in the United States, uh, curate from everything from sort of in entry level curation positions to running the whole museum. So there's a Williams alum right now at the head of the Guggenheim, uh, for example. Um, and, uh, and that's a long legacy just because I like my favorite parlor game. How many of you took uh, art history when you were at Williams? So just look around before you put your hands down, right? So now you can put your hands down. The, 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 uh, I, I mentioned that just to say that even people who didn't go on to become curators often talk about studying art history at Williams and the impact it had and then again that kind of stake in the humanities. So when you say why now, I had to go back in time because um, anything a uh, college or university is good at, you, you actually can't take for granted. It's actually quite important when you're being strategic to think about how do you build on that strength and make sure it endures into the future. Um, and WICMA is uh, an amazing research resource for the college, but um, the current building it's in, which is also a wonderful building and, and we love, but it's not a great envelope for art. Uh, it turns out um, it's better for people than, than paintings uh, and sculptures. And so um, it was really, we really needed um, for just sheer facilities reasons um, to move uh, into uh, a new home. And again, it marks this incredible moment of the history at Williams. And then also it's just worth noting that um, the arts at Williams, uh, at, in Williamstown and in the Northern Berkshires has exploded over the last decades. Uh, the Clark, of course, um, growing into its own, the birth and growth of Mass Mocha uh, down the road um, ed, has increasingly turned this region, to say nothing of other art forms in the region, dance and mm -hmm. classical music and uh, theater, um, has really turned the, the region into a little northeastern mecca um, for the arts. And uh, we see this teaching museum, which is different, quite different than a contemporary art museum or a, a modern art um, uh, collection like the Clark, uh, this teaching museum uh, as, a, as a distinct and important part of this um, uh, uh, whole tapestry um, that will take Williams really to the next level and again really get all of our students, um, hundreds of students by the way, take classes that uh, either art history classes or that have arts as part of the curriculum um, and will allow us to continue to do that uh, into the future. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I was one of a couple dozen people who were across the way in the athletics and wellness um, presentation. It was fascinating to, to get the update. Um, before I go further with the question here, Maud, I need to ask, is the statute of limitations passed on my degree from this wonderful institution? <laughs> We, we won't take away your degree, but just, you know, I'm going to, like, put my hands over my ears and say, la, 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 what terrible thing are you going to share? <laughs> well, I'll just, I, I don't want to get into the whole long list, but um, <laughs> the Dear Departed Town Fieldhouse, um, I have a little story about that. So when we were here, Mountain Day had existed before we were here for a long time and then was reinstituted, but... I have an, our own version of Mountain Day that relates to the field house. So we had um, uh, practice before preseason, we had conditioning, and we had to run Gale Road one day and then run sprints the next day at Weston Field, and then we'd go play pickup in, the, in, in great old LaSalle. Um, and so the basketball team, finished up running down at Weston one afternoon, and it was an absolutely spectacular fall day, like today and like yesterday. The mountains are out, everything's really, really amazingly beautiful, and so I and another unnamed basketball alum were walking back, and um, we looked up, and two other basketball alums, also unnamed, just forget their names, were 
up on top of the field house. And uh, they said, it's beautiful. Guys, you got to come up here. So, so they, remember, it was big laminated beams that came all the way down to the parking lot. So they walked down carefully, and the two of us walked up carefully. And it was remarkable. And, it, you know, if the field house was still there, we should all go up there. To... <clears throat> so we enjoyed no the No wonder view. we have structural problems <laughs> with the building. I was a lot lighter then. Uh, so we, um, we looked around, it was spectacular, gawked for five minutes, and then we turned around and there was a Williamstown police car and a campus security car. And so they said, what are you guys doing? And we said, we're just looking at the view, that's all we're from here. So then we went up to the gym and we, and we played pickup. And the next day, um, the late Bob Peck, then athletic director, sat us all down in the bleachers before, um, before our pickup game started and said, uh, guys, um, somebody was on top of the field house yesterday. I'm sure it wasn't you. I was studying my shoelaces very carefully at this point. So anyway, with that, I hope I'm still in the clear. Um, so the, the presentation was really interesting. Fieldhouse had to be taken down. Um, the, the interim facility is on its way up out of the ground. T talk about the, the planning process and, and, and how it will roll out from here. Sure, and I, I did hear that some of you attended uh, an earlier session on this, but uh, since not everybody was there, just a few uh, comments to, to frame this. So as I noted in my intro uh, remarks, physical education, um, outdoor recreation, competitive intercollegiate athletics, uh, all of these have a very long history here at Williams. And I'll, we can do the same parlor game. How many of folks in the room um, were varsity athletes? Uh, you can raise your hand. Almost as many as the art historians, not, not quite as many. Well, when, you know, that's kind of nice to see. But, uh, um, but uh, as you all know, um, and as those of you who weren't varsity athletes, but who simply enjoyed the outdoors here, went on hikes, uh, participated in dance programs or other things, um, we have a, a really long history uh, of success, both in varsity athletics uh, and across the board. And we attract students who um, want to excel here academically and athletically. Uh, and we recognize the importance of great facilities uh, in order um, to uh, ensure that those programs thrive, but also to ensure the well being of our entire community. And there's, again, um, I don't have the data in front of me right now, but something like 95% of our students students swipe into the fitness center uh, and use it. Uh, we have over 800 students in the outing club um, uh, who are members there. We have, um, we've men I've mentioned the varsity teams. We, right now, one of the most surging, growing teams on campus is our club soccer uh, uh, team, which is, um, you know, uh, picking up from students who just love to play soccer who are not on the varsity team. So unfortunately, in recent years, I, I think it's fair to say that Williams has succeeded in spite of, not with support from our facilities. Uh, and that's really um, uh, been very clear, uh, particularly when in the year when the town field house um, <laughs> decided it had carried too many students on its back um, uh, for as uh, long as it had. Only two at a time. Uh, two at only a time. two well, at a time. Yeah. Yes, uh, and so um, the age and condition of facilities uh, and wellness um, uh, structures here at Williams clearly um, are not in keeping uh, with similar facilities at peer schools, and this feels like the right time um, to take on some of those challenges. The why now question couldn't be uh, clearer here since we, in fact, had to take the town field house down. It was, uh, it was structurally unsound. Um, and so we've, we've, approached, we've uh, uh, started to address this problem with a three-pronged approach. The first I already mentioned is the opening of the multi-purpose uh, recreation Center, which is going to be an interim field house, uh, and then an indoor tennis facility, um, and uh, that should be open by next winter. Uh, we're trying to move at a clip so that the winter sports teams um, aren't um, dislodged for too long. But just to be clear, I mean, the college needs a field house and uses it for many things. It, 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 it is a, a place we go at commencement if it rains. Uh, we had our um, testing 
per COVID site inside the field house uh, in COVID. So a big indoor space like that is really uh, invaluable for lots of reasons. And so uh, with that, um, we are engaged in a second undertaking, um, which is a wider program study um, uh, across uh, all of our, uh, as sort of an analyzing all of our wellness and fitness uh, facilities um, in order to figure out what the longer term future will be uh, for the facilities projects here. Um, and that program studying is going throughout this academic year um, with the hope of uh, completing the study by the spring. And again, thanks to anybody uh, who attended um, the session this morning about that. Um, and then, of course, third, and coming out of that program study, we will launch um, a, a, what will be a, a long-term building project um, over uh, um, a couple of years as we uh, construct some kind of athletic and wellness facility um, out, of, out of that work. So here, too, um, we'll keep you apprised. There, it, this is not something that will be finished when you're here for your reunion, um, those of you who are in the 50th cycle. Uh, but we will have completed the program study by then, and uh, I hope, and we'll be able to um, share some of the findings from that um, and continue to keep you apprised uh, as we go forward. Great. Um... So one last question, and then we'll um, turn to you all. Um, I mentioned deep connections with people. Um, the, um, I've um, uh, been fortunate enough to establish Betsy, my wife of 43 years, is class of 79. Our eldest son, Caleb, is married to um, Rachel Levy, the same Levy that's sitting right over there. Uh, and um, many, many friends, deep lifelong relationships. So we as a family are asked all the time, so what, what, what is this crazy place called Williams all about? And um, uh, you've been here seven years, not an alum, but obviously deeply immersed <laughs> in the college and the institution, its history and its current operations and its future. How do you respond to that question? Why Williams? What's, what is the magic of Williams if there is something magic about it? So let me um, be a little humble in answering to this question by first saying I'm sure all of you have your own answer to that question um, of why, why it has been and is special to you and what you think is distinctive about it. Um, and while there may be as many answers to that question as in the room as there are people here, you would all be right. Um, that is, uh, the, the magic comes from your own relationship to it and what it meant to you and, and how it gave meaning to you. Um, from my perspective, Williams um, is one of a number of excellent liberal arts colleges in this country, um, but it has a distinctive magic um, that is particular to it that I'm going to try to capture from my own perspective in this answer. So um, for starters, the focus on liberal arts education uh, in a place with a seven to one student to faculty relationship, which is really unmatched um, in higher education, although some come close, uh, which allows us to do things like that tutorial program, a huge number of um, senior research projects, uh, that global studies program, lots of small learning programs that allow people to get that hands-on focus from faculty, but also from staff in lots of ways across the college. We just are, we are um, able to support um, individual or small group learning in a way that um, is really the envy of other institutions, and uh, it allows us to um, to do that deeply and really, really well. Secondly, um, we do it uh, in uh, a liberal arts tradition. Um, and I actually think the way Williams does this, uh, we have a few requirements, but not many. Um, and that really encourages students both to think about the breadth of human knowledge and the depth of human knowledge. Um, again, both, if you've heard me speak about this before, is a little bit of a conceit of the liberal arts, right? You don't in 32 classes learn the breadth of human knowledge and you don't in a major of 10 classes learn really the depth of anything. But both introduce you to the big questions, to how we ask questions, to what it takes to really know something. And again, many liberal arts colleges do this, but Williams does it really 
really, and I think, the, the kind of perfect spread of breadth and depth requirements that gives students a tremendous amount of flexibility while still reminding them of the importance of studying across all of the divisions of knowledge, all the ways of knowing. Um, and that's very powerful. Thirdly, and we simply cannot diminish it, we do it here. And there is something about this place. Um, and I, many of you know, I went to Oberlin. I'm, I'm a proud Oberlin alum, it, alumna. It's another amazing liberal arts college. It has a small faculty to student relationship. I credit it with making me uh, an intellectually engaged place, uh, person. Um, but, uh, and it's beautiful. It's actually a, quite a beautiful place. But alumni don't move back to Oberlin, Ohio. I don't, <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not a thing. Um, whereas here, people are constantly trying to figure out how to move back. And I, I say that, of course, it's just small numbers, but it is, it is indicative of something. It's not, the, it, it's not that fact. It's just it's indicative of something about um, the beauty of the place and how that um, sort of inspires people to the to being open to the learning experience while they're here which is really distinctive I think um, to to Williams and and it's and it's not just that it's beautiful it's isolated um, and that also matters because it means and in, in everything we do we're doing it with each other and it this I we could go back to the question about why Williams uh, navigated last year more successfully than other institutions, and in part it's because we are accountable to each other and only each other here uh, in this valley. Um, it's true during COVID too, the sort of, we, we stand in or sink together. Um, we are accountable to each other, we know each other, there are really close relationships and there's not a lot of outside um, interference in that. And mm -hmm. students have to build relationships and find things to do with each other, because honestly there's not that much to do. <laughs> so so they, 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 they they, their relationships then become the core. So um, your turn. Uh, well, there are mics around. Here we go. Yeah, please use the mic even if you think you project. Thank you. Um, Michael Levine, class of 76 and 77. I started in 76 after two years. I took a year off, lived in Israel, came back and finished with 77. Um, I'm sitting here with, uh, trying not to get emotional, really close friend Beth. Steve, but Beth and I met literally the first day of college, and we're still really close friends, friends with her kids. It's just the relationship. So I have two questions, but if there's only time for one, let me start with the first, and then if time, I'd like the second. After the Harvard decision, I imagine that the admissions process and sorting of students by ethnicity and race changed a lot. So what I'm wondering about is not just the numbers, you can tell us the numbers, has the experience, particularly for racial and ethnic minority students, changed this year compared to prior years because of the decision? And if time, I have a separate, very different question. Thank so, you. So thank you for the question. Um, so just a reminder for folks who don't follow higher ed news uh, as closely, uh, a year ago, June, the Supreme Court voted in a um, landmark case to uh, that um, admissions and for all higher education institutions could no longer use race as a factor in its in the holistic admissions process this is a big change um, and uh, just to put the decision in context, Williams uses a holistic admissions process, which is to say uh, we look at many factors. Nobody gets into Williams because of one characteristic or trait, Nothing, well, socioeconomic, um, athletics, uh, legacy. Uh, we always look at many traits um, when we consider an applicant. And what the Supreme Court said was, Basically, you can look at everything but race. So we can still look at gender, we can look at socioeconomics, we can look at uh, uh, national origin, and by look at it, I mean we can ask those questions and consider them as valid as one of the factors for which we would um, admit a student. Um, and so race was the category that was removed. Um, and so what I've been saying about this since then is two very important points. The first is uh, Williams uh, uh, follows the law. So of course, uh, Williams stopped including race as one of the characteristics in a holistic review um, 
after that decision, uh, because that is uh, now the law of the land. Um, the second thing I've always said is we remain 100% committed to our goal of having as diverse a uh, student body as possible along every dimension. Um, and that means that we would use whatever legal uh, pathways were open to us uh, in order to continue to um, follow that goal along as many dimensions as possible. Uh, so that's what we did. Um, it's been one year, so we only have one year of data. Um, our data for the first year, to be honest, didn't end up being all that different from prior years. So uh, if you look at the incoming class, um, it's roughly what it was before on all dimensions, including um, uh, the number of racial, different sort of the different racial minorities and how they ended up uh, sorting uh, through the admissions process. Um, so the simple answer to your question is I don't think the student experience has changed much because the demographics actually pretty closely mirror what had been true for the last few years. Um, it, your follow-up question may, might be why. <laughs> you didn't ask that question, but like sort of how did we do that? Um, and I would just say that one year does not um, a pattern make, so we have to study um, what uh, happened at Williams and at other schools over years, and we'll see. Um, but I think our all-grant financial aid uh, initiative had a pretty big impact at here, and Princeton's the only other school now that has um, was the second school in the country to adopt an all-grant financial aid program, although they don't call it that. Um, and uh, they had pretty similar uh, outcomes to us, so that may be one factor, although there were other schools that ended up with data like ours, and uh, they don't have that. Um, and uh, so, but, but we think that's uh, a big part of it. Um, we also have a just a really, really uh, strong admissions and financial aid team here, and they had assumed and some outcome like this was coming, and so they did a lot of it research in advance, um, and uh, sort of how, how we build classes and just to think about that creatively over time. So they're always trying out new techniques. And it's really important to note that admissions always changes. Like that was a very big change and it was imposed on us by um, the court. But you know, we, the way students are admitted to college now is entirely different than when you were admitted to college, entirely different than when I was admitted to college, and now entirely different than two years ago. So it's always changing, um, and we're always going to seek to perfect our processes so we can reach our goals, um, and that's what we continue to do. Let's go to somebody, the gentleman here. Uh, Gordon Earl, class of 1975. Um, as a college, former college administrator, I'm aware of the stresses and strains on the position of president. Your, posi your winter study might actually be who in their right mind might actually be a college president. Um, but I'm wondering what keeps you up at night and how you deal with the stresses and strains, because as a former insider, there is a crisis a minute, and it's very stressful. How do you deal with it? You think I'm dealing with it? <laughs> <laughs> what gave you that idea? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So it is. Uh, it is. Um, it is. Yeah. It's a challenging job for sure. Um, I'll say a few things. Um, so. I, I, so. There is stress, uh, and how I deal with the stress is I'm really married well. So my husband's here in the audience, and uh, we we uh, we work through that together. <laughs> um, he. he Steve is an honorary member of the class of 1978, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time talking and walking and both thinking about Williams together uh, a lot, but also trying to think about our children and other things that, that uh, keep us uh, uh, focused on, on the future and, and joyful topics. Um, as far as um, the... Uh, sort of things that keep me up at night and and how I, uh, um, you know, the, the, the thing that you said is true. I'm not, maybe the, there have been more crises in the last few years, there's no question it has gotten particularly challenging, but it's also true that leading a large institution, many of you lead large institutions know how stressful it can be. Higher education is particularly challenging because every single person somehow thinks they know how to run the college better than the college president, and I know that because they write and tell me all the time. So, uh, and often disagreeing with each other uh, in my inbox uh, in ways that are amusing. So, um, so uh, you know, that is true, that there's like vested opinions and knowledge and perspectives that that can can weigh heavily. But that's that I think is not probably more true than it's ever been. 
um, and uh, and just is is sort of part of the part of the fun of getting to know a complex community. Um, the thing that I am most worried about is not really about Williams. I actually think Williams is an incredibly strong institution, um, largely thanks to you. That is to say, the alumni uh, of this institution um, are so committed to its well-being that when the world goes nuts, which it has several times since I've been here, people write me and say, "How can I help?" what do you need you know when there's financial disruption in the world donations go up at williams like people want to help people really care about this institution and it's made it over time it's been led very well prior to my getting here trustees uh, and college leadership and so um, uh, uh, its endowment and grown, has grown all kinds of things have make williams very strong so i actually don't the daily stresses are hard, but I don't actually have um, sleepless nights about the future of Williams. I worry about higher ed in America, and Williams is at the core of that. So when I get really worried, it's that things that are happening out in the world are undermining confidence in higher education in the United States in a way that can hurt the long-term future of Williams, but honestly, Williams stands and falls with all those other institutions. So. Um, if people stop having faith in Harvard and Brown and Princeton and Yale and Bowdoin and you know and wherever that happens, um, that starts to undermine um, confidence uh, in the endeavor. And over the long term, I do think that could be really, really bad. Um, and right now, that's not actually happening. By which, what I mean is, people so admissions keeps getting more people want to come to institutions like ours uh, it's not affecting uh, the the um, sort of daily work of these institutions um, because they've been well led for a long time um, but over time if this kind of challenge uh, that are facing other American institutions the Supreme Court the presidency the media the army the church if those kind of, we have a lot of doubt about institutions in our country right now and if that continues to deepen and spread in higher ed we've been a little late to the party there was more faith in higher ed for a long time but if that undermines um, continues to undermine that I think will be a challenge for our, our country uh, and for the future because we're engaged in um, the work of building the future of research and education and so if people lose faith in that that is going to challenge our ability to to lead well into the the future challenges sometimes alumni ask me you know what can i do to help but you know besides the obvious which is of course uh, what so many alumni already do and we're so grateful for uh, but one of the things i always say is you know remind your friends who went to other institutions how important their education was uh, and how important it is to support those institutions um, because uh, of the um, the need to, to address this challenge. Thank you. Let's go over this side. Some gentleman right here. Nick Tortorello, class of 71. I wanted to make a um, particularly strong point about winter study, since you're rethinking it. Um, what I loved about it was I had like one winter study on Russian literature another one on Paul Tillich's systematic theology. And what I learned through that was really how to look into a subject deeply and intently, and also with a critical eye. And later on, for 50 over 50 years, I was a public opinion and marketing research analyst. And very often a client would come in, like a Pfizer or a Bank of America, and say, we've got a problem. How can you solve this with a survey? And the winter study learning of doing something really intently and thinking about it critically and understanding both sides to things really I found tremendously helpful in my profession because if you're going to be a survey researcher and do it right you're really looking for truth and you're really trying to see what both sides of the argument are so you can understand them intently to ask the right questions and you know the classes were great but winter study to me was really where I really learned to think, to really look into something deeply, to look beyond you know, the cover story and see what's underlying forces were there. So just yeah, thank you. That sounds like great classes. Maybe you'd like to come teach one. I'd love to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, great. It is per. I agree. That's one of the things winter study is great for uh, going deep on a on a uh, single subject. And I 
can't think of any reason we wouldn't continue to do that as long as folks want to teach those courses and students sign up for them. And you know, students' tastes change over time, but that broad point is, uh, is I hope, will remain one of the core things that we keep doing. Thanks. So, somebody in the back sections. Is there somebody back there with a question? There we go. Uh, Jack Sands, 71. And uh, this is not a plant mod, but I do have a, uh, would you share with the group here um, the work you've done over your years here to increase the student body of non-traditional <clears throat> students here, veterans particularly, but also others, um, and what you, your work with Elizabeth Creighton in building those classes and why your reasoning behind it. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so, as Jack says, we've uh, since I've been here, one of my uh, initiatives, we, we talked at the beginning about things you're proud of. This is actually also something I'm really excited about, this program. Um, but uh, we, we started to build out um, our non-traditional student program. I think there were four non-traditional students uh, when I got here. Non-traditional, we mean, what we mean when we say that is students who've come back to college after doing something else um, because they decided they want a four-year liberal arts education. So that's included veterans, it's included students from community colleges, um, or others who've taken a big break uh, in their education um, and found their way uh, to Williams. Um, and so, as I say, we I think there were four when I came. We, we've been building that program up. We have uh, somewhere between 35 to 40 now. Um, and they include a mix of those different kinds uh, of students um, who have for various reasons come to the conclusion that uh, four years of this kind of education would be important to them. So it's been really exciting. Um, it's, uh, it's an expensive program because many of the students we bring back um, come because they're older, they come with uh, or, uh, families. Um, so we need to provide childcare or housing or, some, or health insurance sometimes or other things that is um, uh, along with the full financial aid program um, that we uh, offer to other students on full financial aid. Um, so it's it, it's taken a little more of an investment and therefore has been a kind of a, a separate fundraising campaign unto itself. Um, but the, to pick up, I think, at the heart of your question, what um, is really exciting about this program to me is um, we believed about, uh, in diversity on all dimensions, as I mentioned before. Um, and one of the things these students bring is a kind of life experience uh, um, and, and um, the wisdom that comes from being a little bit older sometimes uh, uh, into the classroom with students who are on a much more sort of directed path who are just sort of automatically coming to college because it was the next thing they were supposed to do. Even our first generation students, uh, you know, very often were in magnet programs that were sort of directing them to college and they knew they would go to college, which is great. I, there's nothing wrong with that. But having some folks who uh, really understand why they're here from a slightly more advanced part of their lives, sometimes just by a few years, and sometimes uh, we've had a few students even in their late 30s, um, is really uh, enriches the experience um, for everybody. Uh, and that's been great. Um, right there, right in the middle. Oh, that, you already got to ask a question, so. There's a hand I'm way so in the sorry. back over way there. In the back. Yeah. Way in the back, sorry about that. Uh, Joe Bond, class of 75, as your first strategic plan starts to mature, have you already been considering and thinking of the next one? And can you give us a glimpse into some of your thoughts? Oh, that's so great. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, no rest for the weary. Um, so actually, it's a great, it is a really great question. Um, when I, when we, when we created that strategic plan, I'll say, let me say two things. When we created that one, I said it was a 10 to 15 year plan. So we're only year seven. So I would say we're, we're some of the things that we were talking about here, everything I talked about was in that plan, even amazingly, the town field house. I mean, I didn't know we were gonna have to pull it down, but we did know that we needed to invest in well-being and athletics facilities at Williams. Uh, and so, and some of the, the things that we are seeking to accomplish, the building of the museum, the focusing on athletics uh, and facilities, uh, athletics facilities, um, were really, you know, they weren't things that 
upon completing the strategic plan, we could immediately get done. It was going to take time, and we've, we've um, continued to build out um, several programs, some, many things we haven't talked about uh, today, um, over, the, over the arc of that. So I'm not quite ready for another plan yet, because I really feel like I'm in the middle of this one. But it's worth noting the difference of a higher ed strategic plan from, a, say, corporate strategic plan or business, which is where the world that many of you are from. Um, you know, I think, I have not been in the for-profit world, so I'm about, I'm about to say something that might be wrong, but my impression of strategic plan in the uh, for-profit world um, is you, you set them out, you have goals, and then you either achieve or don't achieve those goals, uh, and then uh, make another one with ver that are very goal-focused. Uh, in higher ed, as the length of my strategic plan makes clear, um, which was something like 25 pages long, um, it includes a lot of things in it that are really ongoing work um, and that help us make decisions for how we're going to spend money, how we're going to raise money uh, as we go forward. Um, and so every year when we do budgeting, you know, people have many good ideas, some of which fall into the long-term planning of the college and some of which don't, and we use the strategic plan to help us make decisions, focus focus us and get everybody in our diverse community on the same page to understand what the next sort of 10 years are going to look like. So if somebody walks in my office tomorrow and says, what Williams really needs is an engineering school, I could say, well, that's an interesting idea, but it's not in the strategic plan. <laughs> that's not what we're focusing. Maybe the next one, right, to your point. Um, so it, it is also a way of just sort of helping everybody understand the direction in which we're going. Um, so that is to say, Williams will have another strategic plan. Um, I am sure of that. Um, and they're really helpful and important, um, but probably not at least for another three to five years, I think, um, since we're, would it make a lot of sense to, to even begin to launch that project? Having said that, I do know some of the things that will be in that plan. There will be a focus on dining. There are going to be ongoing focus on resident. This is just buildings right now, but uh, residential refreshing of residential uh, uh, um, spaces, which we're already starting now, but will be a multi-year process and various academic things. So there's there's you know long long-term view in as I think about uh, the Williams of uh, say ten years from now too. Okay, last last question, um, right here. Good morning, I'm Rob Cunningham from the class of 66. Uh, you've talk on, you talked uh, very helpfully about balancing discussions, uh, having guardrails uh, with respect to the Ukrainian war and Palestine. Have there been guardrails in political discussions? This is the most important election in my life. I served both Republican and Democratic administrations. What have been the extra guidelines or the extra cautions that you've tried to employ at Williams to keep the discussion active? Thanks. Uh, great question. We're in the middle of a, 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 a election season. I hope you've seen uh, one of the big activities that go on on campus uh, is encouraging people to register to vote. Famously, young people don't vote. It's a strange phenomenon. It's not uh, particular to uh, Williams for sure. Uh, we actually have a pretty good voting record here because we have this wonderful student not-for-profit called EF Votes. And they're the ones that have hung those signs and they actually help students figure out how to vote. Uh, most students don't vote here, so how to, how to get them registered in their own states and make sure that they're taking care of that. Uh, civic duty, um, even when they're far away from home. It's much easier now than it used to be to do that. So uh, EFOTES votes helps, uh, helps them and starts well in advance so they don't miss deadlines, uh, et cetera, which again, is quite common for students studying away from home. Uh, in terms of the nature of the dialogue, um, I, it's actually a great question and it, it, it um, builds really well on what I was saying, which is that um, you know the college doesn't have a political point of view, right? So we're not promoting one particular party or candidate or sets of issues uh, as a college, even if I have my own uh, views on every issue, to be sure. Um, instead, what we hope we're, we can do is offer to students who want to learn and who are curious about the range of issues uh, and what's going out there. And we do that, again, both through sort of students' own 
agency, so things like eFotes and other or student organizations that promote issues, but also through a whole variety of um, faculty-led discussions or guests we bring to campus uh, who talk about political issues. And um, there are quite a number, actually, of panels or um, events that are going on that uh, bring students uh, along on that journey, both before, but also I'm hoping uh, and I think optimistically seeing the development of programming for after the election because there's I think quite a number of people who are concerned we're not really going to know uh, the outcome of the election immediately and so uh, sort of helping students understand what's happening um, in real time uh, throughout the days and weeks after the election I think is uh, also going to be um, a useful uh, service um, you know as we as we go through uh, whatever November is going to bring um, in that space so um, and then we do things like election watching and debate watching parties so if uh, you follow if notes you would see that uh, I think it was in this one I'm, I'm, I may be wrong but um, photographs of students in Pereski in the Baxter part of Pereski uh, watching the debate um, between um, Trump and Harris and then the vice presidential debate a couple of weeks later so we do things like that as well and that brings usually students from um, both sides of the political spectrum that collaborate to, to co-host those events together. So, thank you. So, um, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Maud. It's wonderful to thank be you. with you. Thank you. Thank um, you.